I'm Barbara Wall from the Office for Mission Effectiveness, and I'm delighted you're here this afternoon. <coughs> this uh, talk by Father Greg Boyle is sponsored by the Office for Mission Effectiveness and uh, the Office of Service Learning of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. There are plenty of places. Thanks. And tomorrow he'll be uh, with the students and faculty and staff at St. Joe's. You know that school down the road a piece, that Jesuit school. Okay. Um, Father Greg Boyle grew up in California and prior to 1986 he taught at Loyola High School and worked with Christian-based communities in uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia. He was appointed as pastor of Dolores Mission in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles in 1986 where he served through 1992 before returning to Los Angeles and Dolores Mission. In 1992, as a response to the civil unrest in Los Angeles, Father Greg launched the first business, Homeboy Bakery, with a mission to create an environment that provided training, work experience, and above all, the opportunity for rival gang members to work side by side. The success of the bakery created the groundwork for additional businesses, thus prompting Jobs for a Future, or known as JFF, to become an independent nonprofit organization. Homeboy Industries became this nonprofit organization in 2001. Today, Homeboy Industries, nonprofit economic development enterprises, includes Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Maintenance, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, and Homegirl Cafe. As executive director of Homeboy Industries and an acknowledged expert on gangs and intervention approaches, Father Boyle is a nationally renowned speaker. I'm delighted to have him here today. He has given uh, many commencement addresses at uh, prestigious universities, as well as a uh, keynote speaker at conferences. Father Boyle was a member of the State Commission on Juvenile Justice, Crime and Delinquency Prevention, and is currently a member of the National Leadership Council of the Iris Alliance Fund, and serves on the advisory boards for the Loyola School, uh, Law School Center for Juvenile Law and Policy, and the National Youth Gang Center. Needless to say, a man like Father Boyle has received many accolades and recognitions on behalf of Homeboy and especially for his work with former gang members, including the California Peace Prize. On September 17, 2007, Father Greg received the Humanitarian of the Year Award from Bon Appetit magazine during their 10th annual award ceremony in New York. He also received the Caring Institute's 2007 Most Caring People Award and was recent 2008, marks the 20th anniversary of the work Father Greg began. Homeboy Industries, now located in downtown Los Angeles, is recognized as the largest gang intervention program in the county and has been. Greg, please join me in warmly welcoming Father Greg Boyle once again to our Villanova campus. It is an honor and a privilege to have you with us, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Actually, that's not my book. Uh, somebody wrote it, a uh, journalist. First, as Barbara mentioned, as pastor of the poorest parish in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, uh, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, and together they comprise the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. Uh, we had eight gangs at war with each other, half, half the gangs at war with the other half. Uh, I buried my first kid killed because of all the sadness in uh, 1988. I buried my 159th. Um, about two months ago, a guy named Henry. And then that brought gang members to the church and then they said, if only we had jobs. And so we tried to, after that point, go to the surrounding factories and find felony friendly employers. And that was sort of challenging. So then when we couldn't find enough employers willing to give uh, homies and homegirls a chance, we started our own businesses, uh, first with Homeboy Bakery. A month later, Homeboy Tortillas in a factory in downtown LA. 
And then once we had two businesses, we came up with the highfalutin name, Homeboy Industries, as if it was some big industries, you know. And 14 doctors, huge counseling, mental health department, legal department, housing department, case management, curriculum. We still have a, we started a brand new charter school. Uh, now we're the largest gang intervention program in the U.S. of A. A thousand folks a month walk through our doors from 45 different zip codes. There are 1,100 gangs in L.A. County, 86,000 gang members, so it's a pretty daunting uh, task. We have five businesses, as Barbara mentioned, uh, Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy um, Young Ladies from Rival Gangs, Waitresses with Attitude. We'll gladly take your order if you ever get to L.A. Uh, a lot of things didn't work. Anything worth uh, uh, succeeding at is worth uh, having occasional failures at. Uh, like we, we had homeboy plumbing. That didn't work so well. You know, uh, who knew uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, I didn't see that, see that coming. But, uh, uh, and so, you know, we've had a lot of starts and stops. In, uh, but now we're uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of a large place in the brief time I have world such that uh, presses on to fulfillment and it will. part of our mission as people of faith and of commitment is not to uh, cross our arms and tap our feet and stare at our watch. You want to kind of make things happen. So what is it that, that we exactly together uh, want to make happen that connects uh, a gang intervention program in the heart of LA and uh, the work that you do in your study and in your commitment as people of faith? Well, I want to suggest that it is, uh, in fact, the creation of a community of kinship. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem, of course, in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we together stand against forgetting that we belong? Uh, to that end, uh, I suggest to you that what we do, in fact, is we stand at the margins with the those folks who are poor and powerless and voiceless. We stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. You choose to stand, in fact, with the easily despised and the readily left out. You stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. You stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. It is, in fact, about standing at the margins and imagining with God a circle of compassion and then imagining that nobody's standing outside that circle. I think that's the thing that joins us together in our common effort to create a community of kinship. Uh, kinship uh, declares that there is no them, it's just us. If kinship, in fact, was our goal, we would no longer be uh, promoting justice, we in fact would be celebrating it. That's the idea. Kinship is, is a funny thing, you know, you blink and you miss it and you don't want to. Uh, I'm in 25 different detention facilities where I go say mass as a priest and I, you know, I always hand out my card to the gathered uh, gang members, places packed with gang members, almost only gang facility or the jail, packed captive audience of gang members and they say, hey, call me when you get out. Ask for my card when you file out of this classroom or this gym or wherever we have mass. Take my card. Don't slow drag, because if you slow drag, you're going to get pummeling. You name it, we can do it. Call me when you get out. And I remember uh, once a homie, 17 years old, Louis, uh, shows up, happier in a clam, and he plunks himself down in my office and he says, Here I am. I just got out yesterday. And you are the very first person I came to see. And never in my life had I seen more hickeys on a human being than on this guy, Lou. Unbelievable. <laughs> there was kinship so quickly. There was no us and them, just us. I remember once a homie named Dreamer, who I'd known since he was a little kid in the projects in Pico Gardens, uh, a knucklehead, a gang member, into selling drugs, into getting high, in and out of prison. I, you know, I don't know how many jobs I found, to, found for this guy over the course of my two decades in knowing him, probably about 19 jobs, you know, and sometimes he'd, he'd, he'd flake out or he'd, you know, uh, get arrested again. And so this time he's out of prison. And so he comes to see me office. I call 
uh, who has a very dangerous sense of humor, came into my office and he was uh, waving his first paycheck after his two weeks of working at the vending machine company. And he says, wow, look at this paycheck. You know, I mean, my mom, she's proud of me, my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And he looks at me and he says, and you know who? And he looked at me strangely and he says, well, God, of course. I said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, God. Uh, and he looked at me and he says, you thought I was going to say you, didn't you? And I said, no, gosh, no. Heck, uh, God's number one. Yeah. I, uh, and he looked at me and he says, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. And I said, sorry, the Genesis days? He, yeah, because God would have been had struck your ass down already by now. <laughs> suspect that you all have service learning or, or you're in a place where you'll go maybe on uh, spring break or uh, some kind of time where you go obliterating what the, the Buddhists call the illusion of separation. There is no them, there's never been a them. Clinging to a them has exactly gotten us into trouble. I guess I never felt a sense of kinship more keenly than in my own life. Uh, in the last few years, I, I've struggled a little bit with uh, health. Uh, was diagnosed with leukemia, went through chemotherapy, feeling okay. Or as one of the homies said to me, I hear, I hear your cancer's in intermission. He said, and I go, yeah, apparently it's stepped up to the lobby to buy some popcorn, you know. So, uh, uh, but when this got announced on the front page of the Sunday LA Times, uh, a big article. So, so the homies and the homegirls, they, they just bombarded my, uh, uh, my voicemail, you know, and uh, came out of the woodworks. I remember a homegirl home named China called me, uh, left a message. She says, now it's our turn to take care of you. Very sweet. You know, and, he's, uh, and he stands in front of my desk, you know, a lot of tattoos and big tears in his eyes. And he says, what? I, I, I was really happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs, you know. And uh, one of my favorites was a 15-year-old little mocosita, little kid who came in, little gang member, knucklehead. He came sort of late in the game. Uh, I had been almost done with all my chemo, but I had come back to the office after treatment. I always wanted to be there rather than any place else. And, and this kid plunks himself down in a chair and I'm behind my desk and he just looks stricken. My cat had leukemia. <laughs> yeah, she died. Like, oh gosh, uh, boy, sorry to hear that. I uh, really glad you stopped by. It just can't tell you how you just picked me up right there, you know. And one of my favorites was from a homie named, everybody called him Loco. Uh, uh, Robert in local called me from jail collect and uh, he had just read this in the LA Times and he said hey what's up with this leukemia anyway and I said well it's it's cancer you know it's in the blood um, the doctor says my white counts too high and local says them doctors they don't be knowing nothing I said well what do you mean he goes well hello of course your white counts high. <laughs> you white. And uh, so I, I find if I accept more collect calls from jail, I'll just start calling them second opinions, I guess. So <laughs> it's kinship. It's about discovering there is no daylight that separates us. Once you discover that, suddenly the world looks differently. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. It's just the way it works. Always has been, always will be. If our goal is kinship, everything else seems to kind of work itself out. I remember a number of years ago, a homie named Carlos, 24 years old, just released from Corcoran State Prison, a California prison. Uh, the day before he was released, he shows up the next day in my office. And first thing he says is, do you remember me? And why would I remember him? It's been 10 years. He was 14 when I met him at Juvenile Hall, just a little kid. Now he's, uh, you know, right out of prison and, and, and looks exactly as you might expect him to, uh, kind of menacing looking and, uh, you know, really built from lifting weights all day and covered with tattoos. I mean, just alarming. His, his neck was blackened with the name of his gang, which was Toonerville. So Toonerville, uh, black. From, head, uh, from collarbone to uh, jawbone. Head shaved, which is typical among Latino gang members, covered with 
uh, tattoos, alarming tattoos on his face, on his head. But most alarming of all, though exquisitely done, are these two very black devil's horns reaching down to the middle of his forehead and up into his scalp. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe we could put our heads together on this one and I'm about to inch him towards a tattoo removal. And he says, but you know, I, I've never worked at... So uh, we, our biggest business is our homeboy silkscreen factory. So I decided to send Carlos there. This was a Monday. I said, you begin tomorrow on Tuesday. Now, um, that's our biggest business, a million dollar business, been around for 13 years. Uh, thousands of enemy gang members have worked side by side there. Um, high quality work, reasonably priced. We UPS to Philadelphia. So if you need, if you need anything, please uh, holler. I'll, I'll hand you my card afterwards. Uh, so I send Carlos to uh, the silkscreen factory. That was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I'm curious how he's doing. So I call uh, Gabby, the receptionist, and I say, bring that new guy with the devil's horns to the phone. So Carlos comes to the phone and I said, hey, how's it feel to be a working man? And he says, it feels proper. Yeah, I'm holding my head up high. In fact, I'm like that guy on the commercial, you know, the one who walks up to total strangers and says, I just lowered my cholesterol. <laughs> yeah, that's me right there. I go, wow, Carlos, that just flew over my head. What, cholesterol? He said, yeah, yesterday after work, I'm dirty and I'm tired, sitting at the back of the bus. I couldn't help myself. I kept turning to total strangers. I'm just coming back. My first day on the job. Just got off. First day at work. Of course, I'm imagining the people on the bus, you know, kind of wondering, are mothers clutching their kids a little more closely, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking somebody must overhear this kid and say to himself, Hey, good for you. Nice going. Bien hecho. Once he takes a look at this guy, what a waste of a perfectly good job. The prophet Isaiah writes, In this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You don't have to wait till you graduate to make those voices heard. What I think we're all called to be is what the child psychologist Alice Miller calls enlightened witnesses, people who through kindness and tenderness and focused attent of love return people to themselves, kids in particular, I guess. It's about returning people to themselves. It's never about holding up the bar and asking anybody to measure up. It's about you showing up and holding the mirror up and telling people the truth of who they are, that they are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And once you show that to a person, watch them and death can't touch it because it is that huge. But a lot of times, you know, you, you have to do battle with people's sense of themselves else. There's a homie who works for me now named Fili, Filiberto, and uh, he's in a wheelchair. Uh, we've got about five behind who was shot in the face. But Fili, when he first came to me, he was kind of a sad sack. It had nothing to do with the fact that he was paralyzed. It's just the way he was. I remember he was just uh, beat himself up because he was the only gang member in his large family. I remember once my older brother and his wife uh, showed up at one of our new headquarters to get a tour. When they left, Fili, I said, well, he's a principal at a middle school in San Diego. And he said, and your cuñada, your sister-in-law. I said, well, she's a nurse at an intensive care unit at a hospital. And Fili shakes his head with great sadness. And he says, damn, gee, everybody in your family is somebody. Which meant, I guess, of course, that everybody in his family loved us. And, he, and out of the blue, he says, you know, I found this little flika. Homies will always call a little photograph. Look at it, I can't even believe it's me. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I don't, I don't kind of know where he's going with this. Two days later, he brings the subject up again. You know, I still look at this, this flika, and, I, and, 
and there I am, I'm 10 years old. And I think it was for like, uh, for immigration purposes or something. I don't know why my parents took this picture, but I, I look at it, would be what? And he extends it to me. And, and there he is, this 10 year old, a little goofy looking kid with a big shock of hair, you know, and, and of course he's bello and he's all sh had his head shaved at this point and I don't know what to say. I go, damn, Philly, you got hair. I don't know what to say, you know, and, and I, I'm thinking to myself, is he giving this to me or, or am I supposed to give it back? So the only way to really know for sure is to extend it back to him and I do. And he doesn't take the photograph. He's, he says, do, do you think there's any way we can make it big? I said, well, sure. So the next day I go to the mall and I walk into the camera store and the guy says, you know, can I help you, sir? And I said, make it big. <laughs> and the guy said, I think it's too small to make big. I said, you have to make this larger than it is. And it was a little bit green and a little bit grainy. And this is not a story about a photograph. It's a story about the self made to feel too small from having been bombarded with messages of shame and disgrace. And how is that not the job description of everybody here? To reach in and return people to themselves and tell them the truth and dismantle whatever needs to be dismantled. I come from a, a large family. I have five sisters and two brothers and we lived in a big old house and, and I remember um, my mom used to say, uh, you know, don't go to the attic. Of course, that's all kids need to hear. You know, they, we were selling tickets to the attic once we heard this. So, and, uh, and I guess it was sort of precarious. It had planks and you could fall through or something. But we all went up one day and we, we rummaged through boxes, old boxes, and we found this, this uh, old phonograph record, big thick clay thing, like from the uh, 30s, I guess. And, uh, and it said on the label in handwritten, Kathleen Conway which is my mom's maiden name. And it said, Oh, Holy Night. So the Christmas Carol. So we raced downstairs, put on our little toy phonograph and encircle the speakers. And we all lie on our stomachs and just waiting and, and through the scratchy uh, old, old uh, thing comes this angelic voice. It's an opera singer. And, and we did, had no idea that our mom before she in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Job description as people. It's about appearing and souls feel their worth. It was uh, September from a gang called the Mob Crew, in and out of jail and in and out of uh, craziness all the time. Uh, until 15 years ago, Bandit showed up in my office out of the wild blue, and I couldn't believe he was there, and, and, and I told him that, and he said, I'm tired of being tired. Entry level, unskilled, lowest rung in a warehouse, and there Bandit begins to work. Now cut to 15 years later, Bandit runs the warehouse. He's the supervisor. He owns a home. He's married. He has three kids. And I hadn't heard from him in a long time, and, and no news is good news with gang. And he says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. I go, damn, what's wrong? Is she, is she sick? Is she in the hospital? He said, oh, no, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my oldest, my little Jessica. She's going to college. But she's a little chaparita, and I'm a little afraid for her because she's so tiny and young, and she's only 18, and she's moving away from home. So do you think you could... I don't know, give her a, a bendicion, a blessing before she leaves. I said, sure. I said, look, tomorrow, Saturday, I have one o'clock baptisms. Why don't you come at 12 and uh, we'll do a little send off blessing. Well, the next day comes, sure enough, right on time, Bandit and his wife and the three kids, including little tiny Jessica. And I, I situate them in front of the altar and I put Jessica right there in front and, and we encircle uh, her and, I, and I, I say everybody close your eyes and so everybody touch her put your hand on her head and and, and uh, 
and put your hands on her shoulders. Everybody touch her. And, and as the homies would say, I do some long ass prayer. I go on and on and on. And somewhere in the middle of this thing, I'm noticing we're all becoming chiones. We're all starting to cry. And you can hear the sniffles. Everybody's crying. I don't know why we're crying. Me. But certainly nobody in their families. And so when, you know, I kind of wipe away my tears and we're all kind of laughing at how mushy we got it. I look at Jessica and I say, hey, so what are you going to study at Humboldt? And she was very quick. She says, forensic psychology. I go, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> and Bandit chimes in. He goes, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. And Jessica turns and looks at her father, does a very deadpan, and does one of these, pointing over at her, at her dad. And, and Bandit sees her. He starts laughing. Yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. <laughs> so we go out to the car, and we all big abrazos, and they say goodbye, and they pile in the car. But Bandit hangs back, and I say, hey, dog, can I tell you something? <clears throat> I give you credit for the man you've chosen to be. And he looked at me, and he says, you know what? A bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly God's deepest hope and longing. You ever have when Laura Bush shows up? No. Could I, could I see a show of hands on this? Okay. Her capacity as gang czar or something. And so she came to visit tour uh, where they land at Homeboy Silkscreen. We have about 400 employees. We had about 30 there. You know, it had to be very kind of contained. And uh, on the day of the visit, we had bomb sniffing dogs. We had sharpshooters on the roof. We had uh, uh, sharpshooters inside the building up in these rafters, you know. It was quite extraordinary. And so we had the people who were printing shirts and doing embroidery, and then the small group of like 12 who were going to meet with her in a kind of a roundtable discussion. So um, a couple weeks before her visit, the head of the Secret Service detail said, hey, Father, um, I need the names uh, of everybody who's going to be in handshaking range of the First Lady. I need their names. I need their uh, birth dates. I need their Social Security numbers. So I went to my office, I typed it up, and I handed uh, it to the guy. Well, a couple of days later, he's in my office, and he's looking quite agonizing. And he's saying, uh, wow, Father, um, yeah, these people have records, he says to me. You know, like, <laughs> like this news might come as a surprise to me. And I, I said, you know, at, at Homeboy Industries, it's sort of the idea, you know. And <laughs> Anyway, so they approved. Mainly all of them. They had trouble with one, but we negotiated. Anyway, so she came to visit. Very nice lady. Everybody felt quite special, and she left. Well, three months later, <coughs> somebody from uh, Mrs. Bush's staff called me and said, uh, the First Lady is having a huge youth conference at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and uh, Mrs. Bush would like you to speak at it. And I said, I'll be honored to, happy to. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Bush would like you to bring three homies with you, you know, at, now, whether Laura Bush actually used the H word, I'm, I, we can't be certain, but she said homies. So uh, I said, sure, I'm happy to invite three homies, uh, bring them with me. And uh, the woman said, oh, and by the way, after the conference, a select group of participants, about 100, will be invited into the White House for dinner. And well, certainly, you know, crooks have resided in this house before, but I think it's the first time <laughs> gang members have ever stepped foot in there. So. Uh, I picked, like if you were to go to Central Casting and say, pick uh, three menacing looking gang members, you, you would have picked these three. A Gus, just to mess with the White House a little bit, you know. And so, so it was Gus, uh, Herbie, and Gabriel. And you know, tattoos and big guys and had been done prison time and in their late 20s, you know. And, and so I thought, gosh, you know, we're going to the White House for dinner. You can't exactly wear size 85 waist dickies, you know. So we, we, we got to get some suits. So we went to Men's Warehouse. Do you guys have that anywhere around? Yeah, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. Yeah. Well, that guy wasn't there. But we, uh, 
we, we went to the one in Burbank, and I swear to you, the second the four of us walk into the store, every single solitary salesperson rushes us at the door as if to say, now, how may we help you walk out of our store as quickly as possible? And I said, you know, uh, we're going to be needing three suits. You know, they're, they're going to dinner at the White House. And of course, the guy said, yeah, right, sure. And so they dispatch them to two dressing rooms. And before you know it, uh, I'm out there by myself picking through ties. I turn around, and there's one of our uh, three guys, Gabriel. And Gabriel's in a suit for the first time in his life. And he's staring at himself all alone in front of a six-sided mirror, mouth wide open. He can't believe that's him in this uh, amazing kind of gray suit. And uh, Gabriel's uh, a wonderful guy, about 26 years old, has three kids, been in and out of prison, uh, tons of tattoos on his neck and face. He's already endured 37 laser treatments. Uh, to get them removed. He needs about like 96 more and he should be good as new. And uh, his main uh, job at, at Homeboy Industries is he gives tours. He gives great tours. He'll, uh, in, uh, when tour groups come through, he'll walk them and introduce them to the job developers. He'll uh, explain our release program. Uh, he'll uh, hand you goggles so you can watch tattoos getting removed on the premises. Uh, he gives a magnificent tour. People always mention him. Uh, he has about the finest, most pure, simple heart of any human being I've ever been privileged to meet. Now, the outside packaging might suggest otherwise. The day won't ever come when I have a purer heart or am closer to God or am more noble than this guy, Gabriel. So I walk up to him and he's staring at himself in the mirror and I tap him on the shoulder. And he doesn't move to look at me, he just keeps staring at the guy in the suit. And I say, are you okay? And he says, damn, gee, I'm already pinching myself. Like he can't believe he's in a suit. He can't believe he's headed to the White House. A week before we're scheduled to go, we had bought the tickets long in advance. I, I call him in, and I don't know what, why this occurred to me, but I did. And I said, hey, Gabriel, by the way, did you ask permission of your parole officer to go to Washington, D.C.? And he said, oh, of course. I said, whew, great. He said, uh, yeah, she said no. I go, my dog, when were you going to get around to telling me this? You know, and actually, I wasn't going to tell you. I was afraid you wouldn't let me go. I go, Mijito, we got to do this the right way. What's her number? And he's sitting there. I call this woman. This is all she says to me on the phone. No, high control. Talk to your supervisor. The supervisor says, no way, high control. I said, could I talk to somebody who's like a notch, you know, above you? And I get this third guy, and, and he says, nope. Finally, uh, the White House faxes, uh, letter after letter after letter. This may be the singular accomplishment of the Bush administration. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry if I've offended, but anyway, uh, they secure permission the day before we're scheduled to leave. We were gonna go anyway, but I mean, permission is nice. So any who. So, uh, so then we're going to our trip, and, and these guys had never been on an airplane in their life, and it was uh, uh, mishap after mishap, and it was, we're halfway, they're all late in the early morning darkness on a Tuesday morning, and we're halfway to uh, LAX airport, and uh, I turn around asking nobody in particular, do you all have your IDs? Silence. A lone voice from the back seat. Shit. <laughs> got to drive back and get uh, Gus's ID. We discover on Thursday men's warehouse suit covered in plastic open at the bottom. And in the movement, I guess he jostles the pants and they slither off the hanger and they end up God knows where in the gutter or on the sidewalk. And some homeless man is liking the way he looks, I guarantee it. <laughs> And only on Thursday morning, staying at my brother and his wife's house in D.C., we hear throughout the house, I don't got no pants, you know. <laughs> and it's poor old Gabriel who's pantsless, and so my 
my brother, my sister-in-law, Jerry, rigged some pants to kind of match his suit coat. But anyway, he looked fine. And we go to the conference, and then after that, we walk into the White House, myself and these three gangsters all in their uh, men's warehouse suits. And there are butlers walking down the halls, and they're holding trays of, of a long stem glasses of white wine. And the homies are snatching those puppies as fast as they can, you know, and, and they're, they're a little bit illuminado by the end of the, the evening. <laughs> and uh, there's string quartets and little combos in all the rooms, you know, the blue room and the green room and, and all that kind of stuff. And there's this huge, in the gold room where uh, the presidents of, uh, the daughters of presidents get married, there's this huge buffet, unbelievable food. I, I've never, it's just the most delicious food I've ever had in my life. There was rack of lamb, it was just perfection. There was a, a salmon the size of like a Buick decked out there. <laughs> there was pastas, there were salads, just every imaginable kind of food. And Gabriel's standing there with me and they had these white potatoes cut lengthwise which a, with a hole carefully bore out in the middle, stuffed with caviar in a sprig of chive. And Gabriel grabs one of those puppies and he pops it in his mouth and puts it out in the napkin. This shit tastes nasty. <laughs> the next day, we flew home, and we're midway across the country, and it's an innocent in the world, though, again, his packaging wouldn't suggest that, but he's, he, hey, I gotta go to the baño. I said, well, the bathroom's in the back of the plane. And uh, Gabriel gets up from his seat. 45 minutes later, he comes back. I said, hey, que paso contigo, cabrón? I thought you fell in, or what happened? I'm very innocent. Oh, oh, I was just talking to that lady back there. And I turn around, and I see a lone flight attendant. She's standing by herself. I made her cry. I hope that's OK. I go, oh my god. And she saw my Homeboy Industries shirt. I don't know. She. Ask me a gang of questions. So I gave her a tour of the office. At 39,000 feet, Gabriel gives this woman a tour of the office, introduces her to the job developers, hands her goggles. We had dinner there. I say, well, Michael, what you expect? She just caught a glimpse of you. She saw that you are somebody. Sometimes people cry when they see that. Suddenly kinship so quickly. Two souls feeling their worth. Gang member flight attendant, 39,000 feet. Exactly what God had in mind. One last story. It's an occupational hazard in my biz that if you hire one kid from one gang, you're going to get 10 phone calls from kids from uh, White Fence, which is an old traditional gang that in LA stretching back to the 40s. So I get a phone call from one of the guys, another guy from White Fence, and um, I never met this kid. And, and all he says to me on the phone is, hey, this is Chico from White Fence. Kick me down with a holly, which roughly translates, do you think you could locate gainful employment for me? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't even know you. May, you know. Maybe we should meet first. So I scheduled to go to his house, and I meet this really skinny as a rail kid, Chico, 17 years old, skinny, 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 big, huge, floppy years, shaved head, a lone tattoo on his neck. We sit on the front porch. I meet his mother, Rosa, who is a very nice lady who seems quite happy that I've intervened somewhat in her kid's life. We talk, and I said, hey, Miko, if I found you a job, is there a skill you'd like to pick up? And he's very quick. He says, yeah, uh, I want to learn computers. Though I don't know anything about them. So long story short, I find a place called the Chrysalis Center, which is uh, a homeless resource center in downtown LA. Uh, I knew the director at the time. I had heard on the grapevine that somebody had donated a whole bank of uh, computers. So I give her a call and I say, hey, I got this kid Chico. He's a gang member, but he's you know trying to change his life. Five, Monday through Friday. Um, 
I will pay him myself every Friday, somehow, hold up an ATM machine or something, but yeah, I will pay him. You just teach him everything there is to know about computers and, you know, we'll call it a job. And she said, great, send him over. So I call up Chico and I said, Mikko, your lucky day begins on Monday. Um, and I give him the address. And I say, if you don't go to school, I don't want you to go to work because uh, you got to go to school in order to work. And uh, you have two bosses. One you're going to meet on Monday at one. The other boss you're talking to right now. So if I find out, and I will, if you're hanging, banging, or slanging. So hanging is uh, kicking it with the homies. Slanging is selling drugs of any kind. And gang banging is that activity ranging from writing on the walls at the low end to shooting at people at the high end and anything in between. If I find out you're hanging, banging, or slanging, I'm going to fire you. Now, am I clear? And he says, I won't let you down. So Monday comes, and I know it's, it's part of my consciousness. I'm sitting at my desk. I can see the clock on the wall. It hits one. I go, okay, now Chico's walking into his new job at the Chrysalis Center. Clock uh, gets to five, and I go, okay, Chico's walking out of his new job. At Tuesday comes, and I go through the same routine, one o'clock, five o'clock, I'll stick around. No call, no show. Tuesday turns into Wednesday. Wednesday turns into Thursday. And that's when another occupational hazard kicks in. You start to think the worst. You know, maybe my directions were bad. Maybe he flaked out on me. Maybe he, uh, his probation officer popped him. Just as I'm thinking the worst, at 3 o'clock on that Thursday, out of the fax machine uh, nestled on the, uh, the edge of my desk, comes chugging this memo. Chrysalis Center letterhead. It's from our pal Chico at his new job. It starts to chug up uh, through the machine and I can... I am learning how to use a fax machine. <laughs> I am learning a gang of shit here. <laughs> Love, Chico. P.S. I really love this job. Thanks for getting it for me. It was about five months later that at 7.30 in the morning, I'm fumbling with my keys to unlock my office on First Street, and I can hear the phone insistent inside. I catch it in mid-ring, and it's Rosa, Chico's mother, to tell me that the night before, Chico had been standing not far from his front porch talking to some neighbors, and a car slowly came down the block. It seemed to decrease its speed once it caught sight of Chico standing in the group. When it caught up to them, finally, a single bullet flew from the back seat of the car and it lodged very high up on Chico's neck. I walk into the unit and I see Chico lying there on his back, all tubed up, tubes everywhere, nose, mouth, arms. He's naked, but for a diaper. Most notable of all, though, are his eyes. They're wide open and they're staring at the ceiling, unblinking, like you had toothpicks holding them open. There's a doctor at the foot of his bed and he's scribbling notes on a clipboard, so I go to him to assess Chico's condition. He shakes his head and he says, you know, Father, in all my years, I've never seen a paralysis so high. It's so high, in fact, that we suspect there may well be brain damage, though we're not certain. And the doctor leaves. I walk closer to Chico and still his eyes are, are just riveted to that. And his eyes don't move. And he doesn't seem to register in any way that I, I'm even there. And as a priest, I, I anoint his forehead. I give him la unción de los enfermos. The truth be told, what a hard kid it, it was to visit the next day. I, of course, I knew I would, but it was excruciating. A magnificent, wonderful kid. 
I can still see him in my mind's eye on a Friday afternoon waiting for me to deliver his little miseria of a paycheck. I was always late. To get to my car, you know, which is decidedly uncool, uh, gang members don't run unless law enforcement is chasing their ass, you know, but, <laughs> but he didn't care. He had an absence of care about such things. He wanted to get to you. And get to you, he did. He'd hop on the passenger side and yak, 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 and talk, talk, talk. And he was, as we say in Spanish, bien preguntón. He used to always ask a gang of questions. Typically, he'd ask me about God, like I would know. Is God pissed off at us? Does God listen to us? And far more valuable than this little measly paycheck I'd hand him every Friday was the time I sometimes had to spend with him. And I regret even to this very instant that it wasn't more time. But of course I went back the next day as I knew I would and I walked into his unit and I found him much the same as I had the day before, lying on his back, all tubed up, eyes unblinking, riveted, glued to the ceiling. And why wouldn't I expect the response from the day before? So I leaned into his ear and I said, Chico. But this time his eyes dart to my eyes and they lock onto my eyes and, and I'm startled by this. And I don't know what to say. I look at him and, and I say, do you know who this is? And to the extent that he nods affirmatively, then I'm really at a loss. I, I look at him and I, and I say, Michal, do you know that we all love you very much? And this last thing makes him cry a great deal. He begins to sob and wail and he can't stop crying. And his face says, I bless him again as I had the day before. And I think to myself, the good news is he's alive. And the bad news now, of course, is that he knows enough to wish that he weren't. And so a week passed and his heart stopped and I buried him. And as I blessed the cross on the coffin at Resurrection Cemetery and I handed it to Chico's mother, Rosa, then and only to do it, otherwise it would be crazy making for me. I had put my feelings on the back burner and I really couldn't continue to do it. And two, I realized only at that moment that this was the eighth kid I had buried in a three week period. That hadn't occurred to me until that moment. And so I decided to walk away from from the gathered mourners and I stood on a, near a lonely tree not far from the casket and I stood there by myself. I let it all in and I cried, cried, cried. But I wasn't there very long when suddenly the mortician is standing right next to me and, and, and I'm annoyed that he kind of broke this little space that I wanted to have, you know, and, and then I was annoyed that I was annoyed, you know how that works. So I, I, didn't, I knew it was on me to say something, so I wiped away my tears and I pointed at the coffin and in a whisper I say to the mortician, that was a terrific kid. And the mortician was incredulous. He looked at me like I had three heads. He, he was? Like he couldn't believe it was true. How could a 17-year-old gang member gun down in front of his house? How could it be possible that this was a terrific kid? But every one of you would have been proud to call him your friend or son or brother. And before he died, he came to know the truth of who he was, that he was exactly what God had in mind when God made him. And so indeed he became that truth. He inhabited that truth. And no bullet can pierce that. And no four prison walls can keep that out. Passion will widen. And you stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable 
so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. When you stand right out there at the margins, everyone will say, you are wasting your time. But in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Go ahead, make those voices heard. Will not disappoint, and if it delays, we can wait for it. Thank you very much. How do the gangs feel that you're like the anti-recruitment? Yeah, how do gangs feel like I'm part of the anti-recruitment? Well, every gang member, because they're a human being, uh, wants exactly what you want which is to have a life. And so 95% of them, if you, if you helped them, they would walk towards the light and a, and a life. 5% are pretty damaged folks, sociopathic, maybe even psychopathic. Uh, they need a time out, those guys. I don't coax the unwilling. I wait for, for the ready, and then they show up. But I've been doing this now for almost a quarter of a century, so I know more gang members than any human being on the planet. So you kind of have the juice card and, and the pass card. They don't, they understand what I'm doing. Even the Mexican mafia guys who are knuckleheads in prison have, uh, messes our game. But th they see it. I've never had an incident. I've never had a, a problem. Uh, in the early days, we used to get death threats and bomb threats and hate mail, but never from gang members. Aren't you a fraternizer with the enemy? Or after hours voicemail message to say, thank you for calling Homeboy Industries. Your bomb threat is important to us. Uh, <laughs> you know, press three for Father Greg, you know. Uh, but that also tells you how things have changed. You know, we just haven't uh, gotten anything like that probably in the last 10 years. So th that says to me that incrementally things have changed. Parts of expanded. Yes, back there. What is your view of the Second Amendment, gun ownership, easy gun sales, pistols? What is your view of it, please? Well, I don't know. I just, uh, I've buried 159 kids, 158 of them killed by guns. Guns don't kill people, people kill people, which sure as heck makes it easy to happen. If there weren't guns, my guess is those 159, 158 would be alive today. I think it's insane. In fact, I don't really discuss it very often because I think it's so insane and shame on us and I don't know what else to say about it. I don't really get into a discussion about the Second Amendment. I go, it's insane. Why would you discuss something that's insane? Now people go, but I have a right to my gun. I go, I don't know, come to the inner city and I'll show you how insane it is. Should somebody do something about it? Well, they should have been had done something about it, as the homies say. Yeah? How hard is it to convince physicists to take on like, like hard criminals that you see every day? Um, how, the question is, how hard is it for businesses to accept folks with, uh, you know, gang members or criminals or uh, with records? You know, that's the thing. You know, in prison, we prepare to be surprised that we have the highest recidivism rate in the country you know, that more folks released from prison just revolving door go back. But if nobody's going to hire them, what would you do? You know, I always see it as sort of a thing, work at the bakery until we find something for you. Uh, but it's, you know, I have a nine and a half million dollar annual budget. It's, it's really hard. That's nothing compared to seven hundred billion dollars. But it's a real struggle because, and it's only going to get worse. And we're just, we're, we're preparing ourselves for a white knuckle ride. We'll have a combo burger of Nobody will donate money because times are too tough and there won't be any jobs for these folks. So brace yourself because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be felt in the inner city, certainly, big time. But it's hard, you know, and, and there are a lot of everybody, as, as Sister Helen Prejean always says, everybody's a whole lot more than the worst thing they ever did. Uh, I always get that uh, uh, I'm having a hard time finding a job thing, you know. 
uh, a homie came in, and pardon my language, but across his forehead, the whole expanse of his forehead had said, fuck the world. And he was one of those, I'm having a hard time finding a job, you know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, do you want fries with that? You know, I'm go <laughs> where am I gonna send him? So I hired him at, at the bakery. And he must have had a very angry moment in prison to put that on his forehead. But I hired a guard at a movie studio. Obstacles and the self-destruction, it's all that the gang member. Nobody has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. It's never happened in the history of the world. Hopeful kids don't join gangs. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery, and who doesn't know by now that misery loves company? Gang violence is a symptom. It always points beyond itself. It's the cough that tells you you're allergic to your cat. The cat's the problem. The cough's the indicator. Gang violence uh, says that uh, we, we're stuck in a poverty that's deeper than any other time. It says families can't function under the weight of those economic stressors. It speaks to racism. It speaks to the great disparity between the haves and the have-nots in, ter in terms of access to those things that enhance the quality of our lives. Access to medical care, access to education, access to opportunities. It, but above all, it's about despair. All our laws in California, three strikes and you're out, extend the death penalty to include jaywalking, uh, uh, Prop 6, which is our latest one that we're going to vote on on no November 4, it's trijuveniles as adults all over again. It's draconian, draconian. And it thinks that the problem with gang members is they're just not scared enough. But the problem, of course, is that gang members just aren't hopeful enough. From 12, uh, we are now currently the only country on the face of the earth that cannot tell the difference between a child and an adult. And this Proposition 6 is only going to make that easier. Do you remember years ago, uh, there was a teacher named Mary Kay Letourneau. She was 34 years old. She was an elementary school teacher. She uh, had a 13-year-old student. Uh, um, and she had a sexual relationship with this 13-year-old. Uh, she gets pregnant. At 14, she's hauled in front of a judge, which she ought to be. And she's sent to prison, which she ought to be. And the now 14-year-old boy uh, gets in front of the judge, and he pleads with the judge. This is, And the judge, with great compassion, looked at the kid and said, I understand, but you're a child. This shouldn't happen to you. Adults don't get to do this. You're a child. If he had killed her instead of you can't be on the face of the earth that doesn't know the difference between a child and an adult. Shame on us. End of commercial announcement. Any other questions? Someone has a question here. Yeah. You know, hope is relational, and it's uh, loving, caring adults who pay attention, and that, that's basically what works. Uh, all hands on deck. I can't think of a single person, single adult, who couldn't be helpful in this regard in any city in this country. It's about people uh, choosing to be messengers of hope. Uh, Emily Dickinson, the poet, writes, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, that sings the song without the words, and never stops at all. It's really the task of every human being with a pulse to sing the song without the words and to show up in the lives of, of kids who are indeed damaged and who are hopeless. And, uh, and hope is foreign to them unless you show up and communicate it. Anyway, thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you very much.